Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, warning you against the upcoming issuance of the Mark of the Beast. And in this video, what we're going to do is review the scripture that identifies what a beast is. And in the process, we'll be identifying who is the man whose name has the number 666. And then we'll be looking in scripture to explain what the mark of the beast is, putting that all together along with our current events and understanding how this mark of the beast will be issued much sooner than you think. So go ahead and hit the like button. Make sure you watch the video to the end, leaving comments as we go and make sure that you are subscribed as we approach this critical time in human history. So then after wasting a lot of time, I decided to come back to the scripture <laughs> and try to get some hints on who this guy actually is. Okay. All right. So we hear about him in Revelations 13. So we're going to jump down through here and pull out a few verses Okay. that will help us to understand who this guy is. Mm -hmm. And I believe by the end of this video, everybody's going to be convinced who he actually is is mm, okay <laughs> all right well let's let's start here at verse one and we'll look at some of these verses real quickly okay and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy now we've already talked about this name of blasphemy here this is how this guy has written on his forehead that he's a replacement for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. You remember, that's why they labeled the Messiah as blasphemous, because he said that he was the son of God. Right. So him being the son of God or God himself was labeled blasphemous for saying that he was the son of God, mm -hmm. which, you know, we all are actually the sons of the most high. Right. Here you have this dude that's actually put on his hat that he is the replacement. Mm. That's what vicar means is replacement. Right. Mm. That's kind of bold. Yeah. So that's what it's talking about when it says blasphemous there, that he has blasphemy on his head. See where it says vicar of Christ mm -hmm. that's replacement of Christ. But then notice this other part where it's talking about having seven heads and ten horns. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we learn in the book of Daniel that a beast is talking about a government. Right. It's mm -hmm. kind of given like a scary name. People think of a wild animal. But anytime we see the word beast in the book of Revelation and, and most of the time throughout the Bible, it's simply talking about a government. Mm -hmm. But this one, this particular government is talking about the fourth beast that Daniel prophesied about saying that he has seven heads and ten horns. And we easily know these as the ten federated nations. Right. Mm hmm. The Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alamans, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, Survey, Vandals, Heruli, Bavarians, and Ostrogoths. All you have to do is look at a chart of the timeline history of the world, and you can actually see these kingdoms come out. There you have the first beast over here with the Greeks, the next beast with the Persians, the Roman Empire was the third beast. And then you have this fourth beast that you see comes out of the Roman Empire. There's your Visigoths, there's your Bulgarians. And if you look closely here, you can find all 10 of these different groups that comes out of the Roman Empire. This is the fourth beast. Then if we'll read verse two. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. What this is talking about is how this fourth beast will have similarities to the other beasts. Mm -hmm. You see a picture from Clarence Larkin over here where it's describing the fourth beast. And he has the feet of a bear. This bear was part of the Medo-Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. He has the mouth of the lion talking about the Babylonian Empire. And he's like a leopard. He's like the Grecian Empire. Okay. And you, you can look at those and see what exactly it's talking about. Like, for instance, how the Grecian war machine, how they, you know, outfitted their armies. And, you know, it, that's the way these armies of the fourth beast are today. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's like the leopard. But he has the feet of the bear. 
the Persians were into conquering other nations and different stuff like that. So it's kind of like he's marching through. He has the feet. And then he has the mouth of the lion, which they was all about education and, you know, training people into the Babylonian culture and doing stuff like that. So you have all of those in this fourth beast here. Okay. But then notice that it says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Right. This is the fourth beast and, you know, how they have so much authority now is because of who they're getting their power from. Okay. And, you know, you could do research on that, how they have meetings with this guy. And anyway, look at verse three. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. This right here, what I'm understanding from my online research is that this is pointing to the fall of the Roman Empire as far as the Pope is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, back there with the um, Protestant revolt and how they pretty much uh, almost annihilated the papal system, but it recovered. Right. But we're gonna, we'll come back to that. Okay. Then look at verse four. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So what this is talking about is all of these federated nations. Mm -hmm. the, the UN, United Nations, is pretty much made up of these people now. Mm -hmm. And who would dare go against the United Nations? Right. Um, that's what they're saying. Who, who, I guess I just said it, who would dare make war with the beast. All right, look at verse five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. But what he's saying there in verse five is that this original beast was given a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And if we look at verse five in relationship to verse three, what this is saying is, is that this beast that John saw rising up out of the sea was in power for 42 months. Mm, OK, that's going to be one of the biggest clues that tells us who this 666 mm. guy is. Mm. But we're going to come back to that. Let's go on to verse six. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Yeah. So this right here, this beast, this this guy who was given 42 months, that's who he's talking about here, how he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, his name and his tabernacle. All mm -hmm. right. So it's giving us hints on who, who this individual is. Right. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, so to ruin the suspense here, it's talking about Constantine. Constantine? This this right here, yeah. <laughs> this, Isn't he dead? <laughs> he is dead. Okay. But like we said, we follow the truth wherever it leads. Okay. But that's what this is talking about here when it's saying, given unto him to make war with the saints. Mm, okay. And we know what he did. Well, the trickery he pulled on those uh, followers of the father. Absolutely. What we learn is that back in 312, Constantine decided that he was the head of the church. He saw some vision, he claims, that he saw a vision that told him that he was supposed to be the head of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Whereas before he had been killing the Christians, mm -hmm. slaughtering the saints even the day before decided in 312 that he was now the head over them. Mm -hmm. And since he outlawed the slaughtering of the saints, a lot of them banded behind him and actually allowed him to become the head of the church. Right. Okay. But we learn over here at World's Last Chance, one of the very first thing he did was outlawed the biblical calendar, did away with Passover and forced people to keep Easter instead. Mm. OK. And so that's part of what it's talking about over here, where it says he was able to make war with the saints and overcome them mm -hmm. by taking away their calendar from them. He was actually able to have power over them and he continued to actually um, kill them throughout history. He just didn't kill the ones who were supporting him and following the calendar. Anybody who actually tried to stick with the biblical calendar, he had them 
killed. Right. Or right. even through the crusades and everything. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So this is the guy that was talking about up here in verse five that was given the 42 months. Okay. So does that line up? It does line up, but I think you're getting a little bit ahead of us. So let's mm -hmm. go on here. Okay. Let's look at verse eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So anybody whose name was not written in the book of life is worshiping this first beast now. Okay. Or at least at the time, mm -hmm. everybody whose name was not written in the book of life was worshiping the first beast, the government system. In other words, they became Catholics. Mm, they okay. start following the Catholic doctrine, even up to keeping Easter and the other holidays, holidays of the beast. Those right. are the holidays of the beast that he instituted. And those whose names are not written in the book of life are following. Even to the day, they're still following those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyway, let's let's go on. We're still getting a little ahead of ourselves. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, what this is saying, if, if, if you really want to know the truth, you listen. There's, right. there's many people who don't want to know the truth. You know, as soon as I said that 666 wasn't Donald Trump, a lot of people clicked off the video. Right. You know, they go go find somebody else that's going to tell them what they want to hear. Or Obama. Or Obama, whoever right. it is, <laughs> whoever Joe Biden, want. whatever it is, they're going to find somebody mm -hmm. that's going to go along with what they want to hear. And so that's what this was referring to. If you want to know the truth, you need to listen very carefully mm -hmm. because it tells us exactly who this 666 guy is. Mm. And we just got to want to know the truth. It's not who this guy is up here. Because we ain't got to him yet. Look down here in verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Yeah, revenge is real. That's what this is talking about. He who who persecuted the church, the ones under Constantine that did all of this harm in the past. These are the same people now that's going to catch the brunt force of this apocalypse. Mm. You know, that's why I say you better pay attention. That's why in other parts of the book, it says you better separate yourself or you're going to get caught up in the same place that these guys are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a time of repentance. We need to get on it. But anyway, look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. So here's another beast. This is the second one. This is the second one that, that we're talking about him. He's a part of the fourth beast overall but he's another one that's coming out of the the first beast that we're talking about mm -hmm. because if you remember up here it says that this beast up here was only given 42 months right back up here in verse five mm -hmm. so after these 42 months are over that this first guy was given now down here in verse 11 you got another beast that's coming after this guy so this uh second beast is coming after Constantine, but coming out of his teachings? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we look at verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Yeah, so this, this second guy is actually pushing everybody to worship the first beast. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, Jake basically is drawing your attention to him. Mm-hmm. Look at verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So this guy, this second individual is doing all of this. Yeah. But then notice right here that it's actually starting to get into this 666 part. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Read verse 17. We're going to start breaking down who this guy is. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So this is the second beast here that's putting this mark on people. The right. first beast didn't put the mark on people. Constantine. Constantine didn't put mark on people. It's the second beast that's actually putting the mark on the people. Okay. All right, now read the last verse. 
I'm kind of scared. <laughs> 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Now, see, this is why it's important to do our own studies. Praying, of course. You get, of course, all knowledge has to come from our Father. Right. Then we start to learn exactly who this guy is that he's talking about here. Who is this second beast? Who okay. is this second guy? Okay. All right. So let's figure it out. Like we said, the first clue is up here where it's talking about how the first beast only had 42 months. Constantine only had 42 months. And when we look to find out where else in the Bible did we hear about this 42 months, we see it over in chapter 11, where in verse 2, it's talking about how they would trample the holy city for 42 months. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 3, we see that this 42 months corresponds with 1,260 days. Right. And we've heard this. A lot of people have put this together that the 42 months, the 1,260 days and the three and a half years are all pointing to the same or similar time period. Mm -hmm. So that's what I decided to do. Praise our Father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. I decided to look at where we end up when we start off with Constantine in 312 and go ahead 42 months or 1,260 days. Mm -hmm. And what we end up in is the year 1572. Okay. So the second beast would have started in the year 1572. His reign. His, his reign would have started in 1572. Constantine started in 312. And then 42 months later, we end up in 1572. And who do we find in 1572? Pope Gregory the 13th. Okay. Pope Gregory the 13th started his reign on May the 13th in the year 1572. Mm. Okay. So here is the head of your next B system. And you say, well, what's important about Pope Gregory? Right. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that invented the Gregorian calendar. Mm. Mm, I'm starting to wonder now. <laughs> Hell, he's the one who started hints. the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> okay. And of course, we learned in our last class that the mark of our father is adherence to the biblical calendar and its holy days. Well, it was this Pope Gregory the 13th that instituted the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar. Mm hmm. Hmm. The thing about Pope Gregory, by instituting the calendars, he's the one who put the mark on the people. See, Constantine didn't create a calendar. Right. Before the Gregorian calendar, there was the Julian calendar. Mm -hmm. The Julian calendar goes all the way back to 46 BC. So Constantine didn't have anything to do with the calendar at all, except outlawing the biblical calendar. Right. And making Easter a religious holiday. Mm hmm. It was Pope Gregory who created a whole nother calendar system. Okay. So he's the one who actually put the mark on the people. But I realized, you know, that's not going to get us there because everybody's waiting to see this 666 thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's show you how that works. But first we have to understand that Gregory is an English name. Mm, okay. In Latin, his name was Gregorius. <laughs> Gregorian calendar and so let's look at how that name actually ends up being 666 okay you can see how over here I was working on Constantine trying to see if he was the guy 666 his numbers came close to just like Obama's and Trump's did but it just didn't add up but when you look at Pope Gregory understanding how the Hebrew works we can figure out what his name is in Hebrew Gematria Okay. Or real gematria. Now, first we have to understand that there's no vowels in the Hebrew. Right. So all of these vowel sounds are going to get a zero. Okay? Right? Because that's just the way the Hebrew works. What about the I? We'll come back to the I in a minute because it's not really a vowel sound. It does actually have a number here. Okay. So we'll start with Gregorius first. You have the G, the R followed by a G and a R. The Gimel is three. The Resh is 200. You see, those four letters gives us 406. Okay. The I would be the Yod. 
I and Y is actually the same thing. They're just like there's no J mm -hmm. in the Hebrew, there's no I in the Hebrew either. Okay. Both the J and the I are really the Yod. Okay. That's why some names are like Israel and some names are like Joseph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I, but, I always wondered that, but okay. <laughs> but now we get a 10 there. Then the S, the S sound is this to sets, which gives us a 90. That gives us a total of 506 for Gregorius. Okay. Now all we have is the Pope. Right. And that is two letters? Two letters, P and P, or Pew and Pew, both would give us the 80. So that gives us 666. Mm. So, it says that he would cause, so by him bringing in the Gregorian calendar, he caused the people to take the mark. By instituting that calendar, by publicizing that calendar, he's made everybody rich, poor, bond, and free. Mm. To take on the mark of the beast. You're taking on the mark of the beast by following the Gregorian calendar. Wow. He's the guy of 666 and his his mark he's put on us, put on the world by making people follow the Gregorian calendar. Wow. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Yeah, and there you go. When you look at his name, Pope Gregorius, that's what you end up with. Okay, now in that clip, we learned what the beast is, who the beasts are today. And we also learned who the man is whose name is 666. Well, in this next clip, we're going to be talking about this mark that he has put on humanity and what exactly it is. If you haven't done so already, make sure you have that like button pushed and your subscription and bell notification button activated. We're starting off with the book of Revelation chapter 13, which for most of us, this is the first time we've heard about the mark of the beast down there in about verse 17. But let's look back up there at verse 16, which says, and he calls if all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You already know who it's referring to when it says he causeth. We'll address it a little bit, but like I said, it's well known who that person is. What we really need to pull out of this verse is how the mark is in the right hand and on their forehead. That's our biggest clue other than who he is. The fact that it's in the right hand and or the forehead is going to be our biggest clue as to what the mark of the beast is. The next place I want to bring you to is Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2, which says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Now this is our first clue as to what the mark of the beast is, except now it's talking about the seal of the living God. You see down in verse three, that the servants of God were sealed in their foreheads. Now, like I said, verse two is a clue as to what the seal is, especially when you look at the new life version translation of the Bible. It doesn't call it a seal, but calls it the mark of the living God. So what this is telling us is that a seal and a mark is the same thing. So when we put this together, what we can understand is that both the servants of our father and those who serve the beasts will have a mark in their foreheads. The world English translation also calls it a mark of the living God. But notice that the Wycliffe Bible calls it a sign. 
just as the Dawe Rhymes 1899 translation calls it a sign of the living God. So what we can gather from this is that a mark, a seal, and a sign are all pointing to the same thing. So it's easy to understand how the New Testament for everyone reads that the beast made everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves to receive a sign from it. It says that this sign was marked on their right hands and on their foreheads. It's really important for us to understand how these words are used interchangeably so that we can recognize them when they're talked about in the Old Testament. Like back there in Exodus chapter 13, it's also talking about a mark on the forehead. Except here, instead of saying on the forehead, it says between the eyes. Let me just read verse 9. And it says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand has the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. So here it is talking about a mark being placed on the forehead. But it's talking about the mark of our father. Just like in Revelation chapter 7. It's talking about the seal of the living God. Or the seal of our father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. You look at verse 16, it says, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So now it's saying the word token. But when we get over and we look at the interlinear Bible, we see that token is not used. And in its place, we find sign. So in other words, a token is yet another name for the word sign and mark and seal. So what is this sign that's being talked about? What is it saying? What is it? When we back up in chapter 13 and look at verse 6. It's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what we're being told is that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the sign of the living God. So in other words, the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, as some people like to call it, is the mark of our Father in Heaven on our foreheads, between our eyes and on our right hands. This is confirmed in 2nd Esdras chapter 2 when we see verse 38 says, Rise, stand, and see the number of those sealed at the feast, those who have transferred themselves from the shadow of the world and received bright garments from the Lord. What this is telling us is that the sealing process that we read about over in Revelation chapter 7 occurs at the feast. Here are a couple of other translations of verse 38, which is telling us that we receive the seal of the living God during the feast of the Lord. And now that we've established what the sign of our father is, we can easily figure out what the sign of the beast is or what the mark of the beast is. If the sign of the living God is the feast of unleavened bread or Passover, then the mark of the beast would be the opposite. And what is the opposite of Passover? Easter, which under the instruction of the Catholic Church back in the Council of Nicaea, replaced Passover after they abolished it. In other words, during that Council of Nicaea, they forbade the practice of keeping Passover 
and insisted that the believers would follow Easter instead. In fact, that's what the council was all about, was establishing Easter as the holiday of the faith and making anybody who followed Passover the target of persecution. Persecution even unto death. And under the Emperor Constantine, this government figure made it against the law to follow the biblical calendar altogether. In fact, the Gregorian calendar that we use today was created in 1582 by Pope Gregory just to calculate Easter. That's what that calendar is all about. That's why they got a new calendar in 1582 altogether. That calendar was created so that they could recalibrate the date of Easter. In other words, it is a Easter calendar. But is this calendar itself the mark of the beast? No. This is only the calendar of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Easter. Easter, just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the mark of our father, the holiday of Easter is the mark of the beast. Those who keep Easter have the mark of the beast. So there you have it. The mark of the beast being issued as we speak. And for those who participated in Easter, they'll have this mark on them which from what I understand can only be removed during baptism. So some of us have that work to do. In the meantime, check out some of these other videos related to Passover and our father's plan for our salvation.